Our last, our last presenter of the day is Barbara Arneal. Barbara is a world-renowned scholar of identity politics, feminist theory, and the history of political thought. Her research has forged innovative and enduring insights into the political consequences of imperialism, colonialism, and liberalism. Her path-breaking research has exposed discrimination and oppression in Canada and the world by deepening the understanding of how and why so many people are excluded from politics based on gender, disability, age, ethnicity, and indigeneity. Barbara Arneal. Thanks very much. Um, so I want to begin uh, with a question. What is a colony? When I use that word, what does it mean to you? Um, I'm not sure. I don't have my notes on here. On this. Is this okay, thank you. Sorry. So um, a biologist might think first of an ant or a bee colony. A medical scholar might think of a bacterial colony. But for most of us, especially those of us that are in the social sciences or the humanities, the thing that first comes to mind is the political sense of colony. That is, lands, peoples colonized uh, by imperial and or settler colonial powers. Whether that be in the Americas, in Africa, in Asia. And so we can come to the Oxford English Dictionary definition of colony as sending settlers to a foreign territory and establishing control over it. Seems like a standard definition. But the question I want to ask is whether uh, colonies are by definition foreign, or can they be domestic? Based on the last 10 to 15 years of uh, research I've done, the answer is a resounding yes. Colonies can and were domestic. And I use that term in two senses. First, they existed within the colonizing state's own borders, directed uh, at fellow citizens rather than in overseas territories and against foreign peoples. And the second notion of domestic, I mean, is that it was actually part of domestic social policy. Colonies were used in order to solve problems like unemployment, poverty, mental disability, and illness, even as colonies were also simultaneously part of an imperial foreign policy. So where do we begin with domestic colonies and the people who defended them? Let's begin with Jeremy Bentham, the very first um, a comprehensive defense of domestic colonies. Uh, he published an essay in 1797 entitled Pauper Management Improved, in which he proposed a massive scheme of pauper panopticons across Britain that would take all of the poor and disabled that lived within cities and send them onto, quote, wasteland in order to cultivate that land within Britain. In a folio that was only published in 2010, so only became available then, Bentham actually explicitly stated to adopt his plan is to colonize at home. He defends such domestic colonies in explicit opposition to foreign colonies. So why domestic? Why not foreign colonies? Well, there were two reasons that Bentham gave. First, that uh, keeping people at home, the paupers, would be to improve them and make them industrious, rather than simply to send them away. And the second reason is that domestic colonies uh, would create revenues, indeed profits, Bentham argues, um, as opposed to the financial draining costs of overseas colonies. So these two arguments, ethical and economic, we see again and again amongst those who defend domestic colonies. A second example of domestic colonies is Johannes van der Mosch uh, of the Netherlands. And in the 1820s, he proposed that there be built seven colonies of benevolence, a universal program like Bentham, where you would take all of the poor and put them into these colonies. Um, he wrote an essay in 1818 in which he made this case for uh, these uh, colonies, again on wasteland, engaged people in agrarian labor, arguing for the same economic and ethical benefits. Uh, the largest, most famous is Weinhausen, uh, and it has just been designated as a World Cultural Heritage Site last year in 2021 as the first of these colonies that then was taken up and adopted across Europe and beyond. In England, at the end of the 19th century, colonies for the idle poor were proposed um, and implemented by William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He wrote a book entitled In Darkest England, 
explicitly referring to um, Stanley's uh, book in Darkest Africa. It is, and he proposes again a universal program of farm colonies that would solve poverty, not just in Britain, but in, in the globe as a whole. Unlike Bentham, he saw domestic colonies and foreign colonies as interconnected to each other, two nodes within a transnational colonial network. And we can see this is the frontispiece from his book. Um, and here we have the visual display, actually, of what he describes as this tripartite scheme of colonialism. And I'm just going to zoom in on this so we can see at the very bottom of that page is the first of the three colonies. And they were called city colonies. That is all that's left of, uh, of uh, Booth's plan. They are temporary shelters to which poor uh, people are to come and uh, get shelter. But the core of um, Booth's plan was to send those people after temporary stay to a farm colony. And that farm colony would train them in agricultural labor uh, and after which they would be sent as farm laborers either to the rest of England, the rest of Britain, you can see in the background there, or the third of his colonies is the colony across the sea, or to become settler uh, colonialists. Booth actually built a large colony in Essex, east of London, um, called the Hadley Colony, and it uh, resulted in over 250,000 trained laborers sent to Canada to become settlers here, farm laborers. Now, along with labor colonies for the poor, there was a second kind of domestic colony built uh, towards the end of the 19th century, and those were farm colonies for the mentally ill and disabled. First in North America, uh, the, this is a picture of a colony at Waverley, Massachusetts, and I use it because it became a model for both Britain and Canada in terms of the colonies that they built for the mentally ill and disabled. In the first of these in 1908, the British Royal Commission on the Care and Control of the Feeble-Minded recommended farm colonies for the mentally disabled modeled on this American farm colony in which you would segregate the disabled into uh, colonies on wasteland again and have them engage in agrarian labor. The report was endorsed by then Home Minister Winston Churchill, got up in the house, championed it, along with Francis Galton, uh, the father of eugenics, who um, wrote an essay that uh, accompanied both the publication of it in the journal Nature, but also the publication uh, of the abstract of the report for the public. Ultimately, farm colonies were um, created as a centerpiece of the 1913 Mental Deficiency Act, even as the British rejected sterilization as a, as a, as a solution. So what about Canada? First, uh, by far and away, the most important colony in Canada is Canada itself. As settler colonization renamed indigenous territories uh, that are pictured here to become what we now call something very different, the state and the provinces of Canada. But within this process, were the same kind of domestic colonies for the idle and irrational implemented within Europe but all underpinned by this prior and fundamental process of dispossession or settler colonization. Now within that, we had the same kinds of domestic colonies I've been talking about in Europe. First, for labor colonies after World War I, Canada created farm colonies for demobilized soldiers returning home from war um, it's because they came home unemployed. The Canadian Soldier Settlement Board actually furthered the process of uh, dispossession, and it's quite shocking actually to read this and see how much more territory was taken from these very small reserves for indigenous peoples in order to um, house and saddle uh, these uh, soldiers. Th this policy was not only explicitly anti-indigenous, it was also uh, anti-ethnic minority. So it was very much about British Canadian soldiers coming back and against the Dukabors, the Mennonites, Jewish farm colonies, and so on. Across Canada, colonies for the mentally ill and disabled were also created. Beginning in the 1910s, the Ontario Royal Commission on the Care and Control of the Mentally uh, Deficient and Feeble-Minded recommended a provincial farm colony, uh, and that was built in Orillia uh, shortly thereafter as a provincial uh, farm colony. In the 1920s, the Canadian National Committee on Mental Hygiene surveyed each province and published their recommend recommendations in the Canadian Journal of Mental Hygiene. In each case, 
they recommended training as many defectives as possible using the colony model, which means wasteland, agrarian labor, and um, then they would be returned to society. There is also this argument that we see again and again, the financial one, that the province will be saved considerable financial outlay compared to other kinds of institutions. In my home province of British Columbia, a provincial farm colony was built for the mentally ill and disabled and established in Coquitlam, now called uh, Colony Farm Regional Park. So if we return to the question that we began with, what is a colony? Etymologically, we know the word colony comes, derives from the Latin word colonia, which means uh, agrarian settlement. It is very closely linked to the uh, Latin word colonus, which means farmer. So human colonies from their inception were fundamentally about land and labor, and more specifically, the waste, wasteland and agrarian labor, at least land deemed to be waste. Seen through a domestic lens, uh, colonies can therefore be defined as segregated bounded communities in which backward people, that is idle or irrational people, are um, and land deemed to be lying waste or to be improved via agrarian labor. And while in some cases domestic colonies were proposed in direct opposition to foreign or settler colonies, in other cases foreign settler and domestic colonies intersected with each other. Such is the case of Canada, where I think the best way to think about colonies is expressed by Indigenous scholar Bodhi Bur Jody Bird's notion of cacophony. And they say, In geographical locations of the Americas where histories of settlers and arrivants map themselves onto and on top of indigenous peoples, colonialism can be understood as a cacophony of contradictorily hegemonic and horizontal struggles. Understood this way, domestic colonies within a larger foundational process of settler colonization within Canada are indeed a cacophony of intersecting colonies and colonialism. Thank you very much.